happy that a couple of you made it, even though the game will be on soon. And I'm also happy for everyone that didn't make it, because fun fact is I'm not only announcing myself, but I only just finished my presentation. So let's see how, what we can do of it. Building a business on open source. And you might have noticed that a business is in brackets. And there's a reason for this. <laughs> Main reason is we, have, we didn't really yet build a business in the strict sense. We have raised our seed round, which is good. And we think we are on the way of building our business. But um, we are still there to prove it. So um, there's a disclaimer. Don't expect any answers. but. Some learnings, this is what you can expect. Cheesy life quotes, because when I was doing the presentation, I'm like, yeah, that's like so common sense, and it applies to every aspect of everyone's life that I needed to put a couple of cheesy quotes in there. Learnings from about seven years being in open source, and learnings of the last year, where I've actually been talking to a lot of highly successful open source CTO CEOs of large companies and also to a lot of VCs raising funds for ourselves. So first question, not so many people here, but still, do you contribute to open source? Okay, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so um, as you can see by, see by this slide, and it has a developer study been done recently with a couple of thousand developers, so quite representative. Um, the majority of developers contributes to open source, and there's a couple who haven't yet, but they still want to. So reaching developers via open source seems to be pretty viable, right? Okay, but that's just for the beginning. So building a business on open source. When I thought about this, I thought like, what do you want to do? Do you want to build an open source project or do you want to build a business? And of course, there are companies that have shown you can build a business on open source, but that's not what I'm aiming at. If you would need to compromise one, because you could only do one, either a business or open source, what would it be? Because, and there's my first cheesy quote, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. It's not like, and I think this is where a couple of open source business failures come from. You have an open source library and, you know, it grows and you want to build a business. This can work, but it also cannot work. If you really want to build a business first, you'll probably approach a couple of things differently. Uh, unless you're GitLab, <laughs> who was speaking this morning here. And obviously, um, there are always exceptions. There are always those lucky guys. And um, they seem to have just started having their own project and then being lucky to be able to build it into their business. So you start building a GitHub project. And depending on what it's for, is it for business or is it as an open source project, you have different means of measuring your success. And one of the first learnings I want to share is there is a correlation between GitHub stars and users, but GitHub stars does not equal users. It just doesn't. And you'll learn more about that if you have means of tracking what users do with your software. But this is pretty important, and I'd always go for tracking right from the beginning if you want to build a business. Ah, yes, and the next thing is, and I've been suggested it a couple of times, oh, you have so successful open source libraries. You know, why don't you just ask your users to fund you? You know, everyone could donate a bit. Yeah, that's right. Um, I don't really know any big companies um, living solely on pay, what you want, or donations. I know it somehow, or solely on donations. I know it somehow works for um, Wikipedia, but generally it doesn't work. And to give an example, and I think MariaDB is quite widely known, right? And Montevideo's, as the MySQL founder, also like um, CEO of OpenOcean, um, he has quite a wide network, so he has a lot of spread. And still, <laughs> in the last five years, they got less than 5,000 euros in donations. It's an example. 
from what I've learned from other people, I think um, there's some truth behind that. It's not easy, and you shouldn't count on it, maybe. That's also a former um, CEO of MySQL, and he, he just says, like, live, if you do open source, live with the fact that the majority of your users doesn't pay you anything. So, basically, if you want to build a business, forget about donations. Also, in my very personal belief, building a business means you're aiming for profit, and donations should only be for sustaining whatever you've built. So there's a huge difference there. So it's not a business model. And a quick self-reflection point, would you donate? Do I see a couple of people nodding? Ah, uh, not sure. But then ask yourself, to which open source projects did you donate last year? Because at this point, most people are like, yeah, well, last year, mm, didn't manage. Exactly. So knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. Next cheesy quote. And <laughs> obviously, you shouldn't be applying that to your research, because only because it's true for you, it doesn't apply to everyone else, right? You know that. But then you're doing open source. It may be as a business, or it may not be. That's not as important, maybe, a point at this moment. But you might be expecting something back, some community love. It's all, you know, you're all part of a big community. We all love each other. It's open source. Yeah. This very often is true. You get lots of great feedback, but obviously it's not all great all the time. And this has actually happened just very recently. That's probably why I brought it. And you know, the library, it has more than 18,000 GitHub stars. It's widely used. I think it's over 20% of the world's top 500 apps on Google Play, among them Twitter and Snapchat. Not everyone loves it. And people in the open source community, as in every other community, can be very frank, so you need to be able to deal with that. Uh, also, I had a really nice talk this Monday, and I wanted to mention it, because I was talking um, to another speaker at the speaker's dinner. And at some point, he's like, uh, yeah, you know what? I think I need to apologize. And I'm like, why? And he's like, yeah, I'm an event bus user, and you know, at one time you didn't publish the feature I had requested for so long, and I kind of got a little nasty, and I'm really sorry. That's like, you don't see the person behind the project, but I really thought it was nice for him to bring that up and being honest and sharing. Because it's all about, you know, you only see projects, you see your own projects, the other projects, but it's all people. And if you respect that a little more, that's easier. Also, this morning in the talk by Alice, she mentioned about um, that you need to use event bus in the right way because you can get it terribly wrong if you don't. And I know Marcus has been preaching about that for a long time because he could rip his hair out when he sometimes see how people abuse our library. And this is just to show you he still has lots of hair. This is another <laughs> big... Um, or quite, I think, um, popular library web sockets. And I had the pleasure to chat to Alex a couple of times. And he also was, um, yeah, he, he, he was fighting that internal battle on how to deal with the community, getting all kinds of, you know, different feedback, maybe not feeling appreciated all the time. Here's his solution, and I think there's some truth to it. But I think what's more important is um, that everyone is a good open source citizen. And for everyone that does open source, another cheesy quote, don't, don't expect anything in return, you can't. It's just like people get give freely. But also, this is not a business model. Now, the next one is maybe a little bit more crucial. Users and customers. Yeah, unfortunately. I think I mentioned that we have a couple of big corporate companies using some of our open source libraries. They're users. So having lots of users doesn't mean you will be able to build a viable company from that. And I talked to Florian a couple of weeks ago, and for me that was really interesting, because Mesosphere has just closed a $50 million round, I think it's Series C, um, which is pretty good. They're doing well. They're a fast-growing company. <laughs> and they initially, you know, they had users of their open source project, Mesos, 
Netflix, Uber, big names, really cool. And they were able to build upon this because they raised based on this fact, but turned out none of these became customers. And the reason was that um, they really have the tech capabilities to build in-house, so they, they really didn't need to, and they were hesitant. Yeah? I'd say don't expect anyone to pay if you have not thought about a business model. Okay, and open source also is not a marketing and sales strategy. That's also what Florian shared with me. <laughs> like, after they found out that all their great users, huge corporate clients, big names, wouldn't be their clients, they built up classic sales force. Like, people calling, people making sales, um, outreach, cold calls, going there, pitching, etc. Oh, there's... Ah, MongoDB, that's what I wanted to share. And also MongoDB, which probably is one of the most successful open source companies they IPO'd, more than 40% of their headcount is in sales. So I think you should be expecting to do a lot of sales. So now I think I need to jump one back if I don't have a double, no. So think about your business model and expect to have a sales force. And this is also something what I personally think I get a lot having worked a lot in you know, open source and with developers, it seems like developers hate marketing. And I think there's some truth to, to that. Maybe we all do. But this makes it even more difficult for you, as a developer, maybe doing a dev tool, as an open source tool, to accept that maybe potentially for building a business, it's not only about the business model, it's also about Marketing and sales, which unfortunately doesn't equal open source. Okay, but what are business models? We all, I think that's something we all know. So first of all, there is this service model. So you might have support, training, consulting, all around that. Some, you know, companies have done foundations, where they have certificates, all of this. So this is basically the first two. Okay, and then you have I think the now getting more popular models of uh, ads, brand building, let's say it that way, and um, open core, basically. Having something where you, to this open source core, you are adding features, software services, hosted services that are additional, that are add-ons. Now for the service model, it's always Red Hat. And it seems Red Hat is the only company that was ever able to um, build a business on fully only open source. I'm not even sure if that is strictly speaking true because they had a hosted service they were offering to business clients and it seems like quite a lot of profit also came from there. But generally speaking, that's an example given. And if you try to pitch an open source company to a VC to get funding, and they grin at you, and they're like, oh, so you want to be like Red Hat? They're basically teasing you to come into a trap, because like service models today are at least highly doubted. And so I was really happy when this morning, um, Job also shared that they tried the service model and failed. And I know a lot of smaller companies that tried the service model, and users, are just not willing to pay for that that easily. So I think this is a very, very difficult model to pull off. Then ads, what to do, what do I mean with ads? I mean like, I didn't really mean the classical, um, you know, you have a blog and put in some advertisement thingy. So there are a couple of examples. Some, you know, maybe stretching the model maybe, but okay. For example, SQLite. Are you aware how SQLite is financed? It's full open source, which is really cool. They um, didn't get take funding. I think they had all kinds of options to get funding, as well as maybe, you know, having some corporations or being bought. They didn't want that. But um, what they have, they have a consortium into which all big companies, including Google and Apple and Microsoft, buy into in order to be able to steer the roadmap and also some enterprise features. 
That's how they do it. And this obviously is only um, possible at a certain stage. So you must have built up quite some substantial value already. There's the ad blocker you probably all know and use. I wasn't even really aware that um, they get paid by, um, in order to whitelist ads by big, big companies. So that's their business model. So that's great. That's awesome. They're doing good. Um, Mozilla, Firefox, you may know that, you know, for example, large search engines, they want to be integrated. They want to maybe be made the default search engine and they pay big. So that's like one time sales, but then it really lasts. Gitbook, you probably all know. WordPress, obviously, it's a hosted service, like how they're making money, but I believe this can only work as it does because they have their brand, they have the domain, and that's the model. And I put Jake there because it's kind of, I mean, like he's not building a huge scalable business, but it's kind of a small business, a freelance business, where you build on your reputation and you can use it in different ways, right? So, the most important business model being the probably, yeah, added solutions model. And you can distinguish on all kinds of ways. And people obviously very often combine all of these. So, around one of these, you usually would have service models. But I think that's clear. Um, so, as a hosted service, for example, Elastic would have both additional solutions like open core and hosted services, just to give an example. Um, MySQL also is open core now, today. It wasn't earlier, before they were having a different business model, GitLab, this morning. They just said that they are open core. So it's just like you have an open source solution and you have a closed you have closed proprietary software that's sold. And that can be sold, I think, as a hosted service or as a software solution. So that's why I clustered these. MariaDB, they have still the delayed open source model, which basically just means that your newest, if you always want to have the newest bug fixes and the newest versions, you'd be paying. And if you're on the older version, and that's fine for you, you're on the open source version. Dual licensing is, uh, is also probably known to most of you. So if you have an open license, like a GPL, where you have a copyleft protection, so meaning whenever you use the co co source code and you want to add to it and want to use that, um, you need to give it back. So if you want to use that for your business, you might want a different license, and so you pay for it. Makes, makes, makes a lot of sense. And that's a model that works a lot very well in the database spaces. And I put the own product, and I really don't know if that's like a real business model in that kind of sense, but I happen to know this guy, so, um, so he does series, series guide, and you should check it out because it's a super cool app. And he has open sourced his full code, so everyone could go ahead and do the same thing. And he's quite successful with it on a certain level, and no one does, so he's fine, it's cool. And people have been contributing to his project, so he has been benefiting from open source. It's a little different because it's not a dev tool, and maybe that's a huge difference. Yeah. So, there seems to be a huge trend, to, trend toward open core at the moment. Definitely, when you are raising money and looking to do it, this is kind of the preferred model at the moment. My learnings from talking to a lot of VCs is, and now it's like, there's a, it's a little tricky. So first of all, they usually want to um, have all the product, all the code done, being done internally by the internal team at least 90%. Which kind of is a little different from what you'd usually think about open source, right? So it's on the other spectrum. And license. They're really picky about what kind of license you chose because that narrows down your options. And if you find a VC, and there are VCs that are specialized in this field and VCs that do that, that are open for open source, 
they're quite happy if you may not have fully open sourced yet, because then they can help you with licensing, because there's a lot to be thought about here, and you can ruin your business model. So if you're aiming for a business, I think license is where you need to be most careful. And then obviously, as with any other business, VCs, people that will give you money, are looking for traction. GitHub stars, users, builds, etc. So, in the end, it's all around the license, I'd say. And we have the whole spectrum from permissive to proprietary. And I think that's where mm, a little bit of the problem comes in. Because the ease of commercialization goes up, at least that's what I think, the, if you use a commercial license, it's straightforward. So, if you go to someone to raise money, that's straightforward. But at the same time, you need to prove traction to see that what you've built is something someone really wants. So now go ahead and choose. <laughs> it's really difficult, right? So you're like right at the beginning in some kind of yeah, conflict. And you would need to, to make choices and maybe think about in which way you can always still migrate and where there's no way back, right? So overall, open source isn't a business strategy. I think open source, you can build a business on open source, but it's not a business strategy. Personally, I think it shouldn't be. I think um, open source, uh, it comes back down to a personal fit, what you value, what you want, how you want to build your company and your product. This is also a decision you can and need to make at some point on your roadmap as a company, as a team. But in order for open source for us all to be, you know, happy and successful, try to avoid being bad open source citizens. I found this, and it's another author of a very successful open source library, and he was really fed up with all, with so many people using all of his work and coming back to him in ungrateful ways. I think this is, this is also really important that everyone is aware of. Because, and that's like kind of, I'm missing the cheesy quote here, but that's the final sentence. We are all like tiny kittens looking for love, and so is everyone doing open source projects. <laughs> okay, questions. And I'm right on time for the game. I want an extra applause for that. Yeah, please. Uh, I want to know how much of it, like, of your code is internally, like, developed, and, uh, like, you said, 90% of the environment. All. All of it is internally right now, like. In, in, in our case, yes. At the moment, yes. Yeah. Oh, ah, yes. Um, she asked how much of our own code is developed internally. And the answer is simple, it's all, all of it. Any other questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you all, have fun watching the game. <laughs>